Hello Void and All Who Inhabit It, it's me, and today's video is brought to you by spoilers. Like, a lot of them. Premiering in March of this year, Our Flag Means Death, or OFMD for short, has rapidly gained widespread acclaim and support. The period comedy created by David Jenkins follows the misadventures of aristocrat-turned-pirate Steed Bonnet and his crew aboard the Revenge as they try to make a name for themselves as pirates and cross paths with famed pirate captain Blackbeard and his right-hand man Izzy Hands. Notably, a major arc of the series has been the budding relationship between Steed and Blackbeard, also known as Edward Teach. It's this relationship, as well as the deft handling of queerness throughout the show, notably with non-binary crew member Jim, that has fueled exponential fandom growth. However, as attention grew, so did people's curiosity into who Steed, Bonnet, and Ed Teach truly were. Many viewers and potential audience members were unaware that these characters, along with Izzy Hands and the briefly seen Jack Rackham, were based off of real life people. We're no stranger to fantastical interpretations of historical figures. However, controversy arose around the fact that the real life Steed and Ed participated in and benefited from the transatlantic slave trade, but this aspect of their past is neither mentioned nor reckoned with throughout the first season of the show. What's been even worse has been the backlash against fans who do point out this uncomfortable truth about the men these two well-liked characters are based off of. Often with shows that have built large fan bases, especially those built quickly, conversations in defense of the show can revert to a binary ideology that, if you don't love this show the way I do, then you hate it. And as a result, all of your criticism is in bad faith. OFMD is not exempt from this phenomenon, and in fact, one of the worst parts of its fandom is a familiar unwillingness for some viewers to consider that their new favorite fan-serving piece of media isn't flawless. Unfortunately, fandom is no stranger to attracting folks who can apply deep nuance to sexuality and queerness that they then refuse to apply with regards to race. That being said, I want to note, before we get started, that I like this show. I like the way it explores queerness without being based in tragedy, and I'm still going to spend the next however many minutes being critical about how it handles race. These two forms of interacting with media are not mutually exclusive. We have to start with the actually not that obvious shining star of the show, its queer representation. David Jenkins, as a straight showrunner, has been praised for his willingness to dive headfirst into the queer rep pool and pivot strongly away from queer baiting once he learned what it was. In an interview with Charles Pullum Moore, Jenkins discusses the distorted lens of masculinity we've been drenched in over the past five years especially. In response to Pullum Moore's question about how OFMD challenges this burlesque of masculinity, Jenkins states that, I think just to take this very hetero, whitewash genre and write into it more of what it actually was. There were a lot of pirates who were gender fluid, like Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, who were doing the pirate thing before anyone was really talking about women getting into piracy. And then, as we were writing more into the ship's queer culture, we realized that this is just more of what it was. OFMD's ability to subvert the swashbuckling genre in a way that's actually more authentic to history has been a repeated talking point with regards to the show's queerness. People been gay, and we love to see it. As a result, a major appeal for fans has been Steed and Ed's relationship. There is so much out there about the relationship that I'm not going to spend much time here talking about it. If you're looking for an in-depth analysis of Steed and Ed and the queer aspects of the show, I recommend you check out Rowan Ellis' video, which will be linked in the card above or in the description box down below. What I'm more interested in, as usual, is fan reaction to Steed and Ed, specifically how a sharp focus on that relationship is used to knock away discussions about anything else. 
opinions, both good and bad, of this show are clouded by the fact that an often disregarded want for a lot of viewers has been fulfilled. Our Flag Means Death has canonized a queer relationship between two conventionally attractive men. I haven't watched The Great in a really long time. I don't know why that was my first instinct, but hey, let's go with it. This formula is important because all queer relationships are not created equal in fandom eyes. Normally, the formula includes both men being white, but Blackbeard, the character, is not. I'm going to talk a bit later about how I think white people perceive Taika Waititi as raceless, but we can still see how race crops up in the way romantic pairings have an effect on how fandom talks about character with Lucius and Olu. When people talk about Lucius, they mention his sassy quips, his role as the audience's proxy for interacting with Steed and Ed, his role as wingman for Steed and Ed, his clashes with Izzy, his relationship with Black Pete. Although many of these traits lead us back to a focus on the main couple, there's a myriad of things people pull from. Alternatively, most of the discussions about Olu only focus on his relationship with Jim, not meta-analyses on his background based on small things we've learned on screen not speculation on if and how his interactions with Chief Mabo and the Tribe Elder in Episode 2 impacted his decision to give all of his earnings to Abshir in Episode 5, not interpretations of how his kindness and level-headedness is expressed beyond directly aiding Steed or Jim, not fan art of him and Roach and Frenchie sharing the look when their white crewmates act up, just thousands of words waxing poetic on Olu as Jim's partner. And the thing about that too is that it's often still a flat examination of Olu as this supportive, easygoing guy with no depth. There's also a noticeable gap when it comes to fan fiction. Although Lucius and Black Pete are the second highest relationship featured in Our Flag Means Death Fix, they only make up 11% of the total number of tags. Olu and Jim come in at 8%. Ed and Steed tag fix make up 80% of the 4,911 stories on AO3 as of May 6th when I last checked. Mind you, people often tag secondary relationships that show up in the background of a major ship story, so a tag doesn't necessarily equate to narrative focus. My expectation is not that every relationship or every story be discussed equally, but these stats are an easily tangible way to observe fandom once again, beaming the majority of attention to the formulaic slash special, both white queer fans and migratory slash fandom members alike. For those not in the know, migratory slash fandom is a term used to describe the idea that slash fans are always on the lookout for the next shiny new juggernaut pairing. It's not the nicest term, basically referring to people who hop from fandom to fandom in search of an often white slash pairing that can be used as face casts for their favored relationship tropes. While that is arguably a much more shallow way of interacting with media, I'm boxing in traveling slash hunters with white queer fans in general because I think both groups have a similar tunnel vision when it comes to analyzing media that features a popular ship. The behavior connected to a widely popular ship's fan base is the clearest manifestation of the biggest issue with critical conversations around our flag means death. So much of the fan base has wrapped their consumption of this show around their connection to or projection onto Steed and Ed that critiquing the show is received as a slap to the face. Folks get big mad real fast. And in ways, I get it. I get being defensive about a story that is different and genuine and resonant. I get that there is a common trap of our expectations for progressive shows sometimes being unreasonable. But while there are times when that is true, I think the flip side is that a story being progressive or representative can be seen as an antidote to all criticism. This show means so much, is doing so much for XYZ and that should be the focus. But there's kind of a hole in that argument when the main character is based off of a slave owner, the so-called progressive show never addresses that, and fans turn feral whenever somebody brings it up.
Before we get into this like six page long outline, let's talk about what our flag means death does well with regards to race. Firstly, there is a diverse writer's room. Of the nine credited writers, about half of the room are people of color, women or non-binary or both. It might not feel like a lot, but that's more than a lot of other shows can say. Also, Taika Waititi is credited as executive producer for the first four episodes, which to be honest, can mean a myriad of things, especially when there are multiple executive producers. But theoretically, as someone providing a decent amount of funding, he would get a decent amount of influence over the story. That being said, Jenkins has also said that YTT is super agreeable as an EP. So again, it varies. Secondly, the show's style of comedy isn't afraid to make white people, especially wealthy white people, the butt of the joke. My favorite example is episode 5, when Olu and Frenchie create the world's first pyramid scheme to swindle French aristocrats, but episode 2 provides an even earlier example. When the crew gets landlocked, they meet an indigenous group and Chief Mabo, played by the same guy who plays Uncle Brownie for all the reservation dog fans out there, cracks wise about the tendency for interactions with white people to result in death for people like him. Chief Mabo approaches a sad and unfortunate truth with a light tone that wouldn't be possible with an all white writer's room for sure. But these moments in episode two, as well as episode five, also exemplify the third major trait of race in the show. In that same interview with Pullum Moore, Jenkins states that, the writer's room wanted a show that isn't just wallowing in trauma. We wanted a show where these characters can exist in a fantasy world and their race or gayness doesn't automatically lead to a traumatic storyline for them. We have a lot of that, you know? So what if we just didn't do it? The decision to explore historical fantasy that's not steeped in trauma doesn't mean historical truths get ignored for the most part but rather that there's room to play these things up for jokes or acknowledge them for more reason than to introduce suffering. It's a noble intention, but as mentioned at the top of this video, impact has been a bit mixed. Unintentionally or otherwise, removing most of the trauma has stretched to include avoiding the reality of how complicit so many white people were in oppressive institutions. Part of escapist history is the idea that there were many white people wealthy white people at that, who didn't play into systems of harm, who only tried to do the best they could with what they had. And our flag means death. This occurs most ardently with Steed Bonnet. Steed is set up as a man who, among other things, is fighting against the claim that his incompetence lies in his comfort and wealth. But we're only vaguely told that Steed is wealthy because he owns land. In real life, Steed Bonnet was a retired British major who utilized 400 acres of land in Barbados as a sugar plantation. Despite the show's ability to mock colonialism, to portray an accurately diverse crew, to avoid queer baiting, the reality of slavery, especially in relation to Steed's wealth, is rarely discussed. There's this flashback scene of Father Bonnet slaughtering a bird that informs us Steed's first interaction with violence led to him freezing up. We see it again and again whenever he has to face violence as part of being a pirate and similarly hesitates. But Steed's first instance with violence was just as likely to have been him witnessing it occur to another person, which is likely given that he grew up on a sugar plantation in Barbados. Admittedly, the reoccurring flashback device isn't so easy to use when it's something gruesome. Remember, the goal is historical fantasy that doesn't delve into trauma. But the show tries really hard to act as if only some white people would have had fucked up perceptions about race. I mentioned Rowan Ellis' video earlier as a good examination of the queerness of the show, but her analysis has this gap as well. A portion of her video focuses on the show's decision to always make the colonizing force, the overbearing, unreasonable English expectations the butt of the joke. But what's missed is that that almost never includes Steed. Even removing the, this character is based off of a slave owner part, Steed came from upper class society and literally decided to abandon his family for a fantasy with no experience. 
You want me to believe his knowledge of fine dining and cravat robe combos is the only thing he carried with him? That his background never caused him to be malicious or destructive or harmful purposefully to the people around him? There's an earlier interview with Jenkins, this time by Jack Guru, wherein Jenkins mentions that they did very little research into these men. In response to a question about Blackbeard, Jenkins says, very quickly we were talking about it and YTT was like, oh yeah man, don't do any research on this thing. It was like, oh yeah, no, let's not kill this with research. Once you have a Polynesian Jewish man playing Edward Teach as Blackbeard, you're already not in reality. In ways, he's right. This show is divorced from accuracy, so it shouldn't be held to it so strongly. But also, research very clearly was put into this. Again, a huge chunk of the praise about queer rep is about how accurate it is to reject the idea that queer people only started existing from 1950 onward. The whole concept of the show blossomed from Jenkins stumbling across a Wikipedia article. My mistake, the decision was a bit more intentional, but the point still stands. There is some fidelity to reality, to historical estimates still being held. It makes the lack of even referencing slavery by name feel more like a strategic erasure than a haphazard miss. I think the closest the show comes to grappling with Steed's complicity in white supremacy is again in episode two. After the ship gets landlocked, the crew loses their two British naval officer captives. Steed takes Black Pete and Olu with him on a search to retrieve the captives and all five of them get scooped up by the indigenous tribe that lives inland. The four white men get placed in cages and Olu gets treated with kindness, free to chill amongst the people. What finally gets Steed and Black Pete out of the cages is Chief Mabo's belief that Steed poses a danger to no one but himself. But even in this instance, it's not colonial rule or oppressive English standards that are the butt of the joke, but Steed's inefficacy as a threatening individual. This episode establishes that Steed is not like those other colonizers, which in part only helps to build sympathy and resonance for viewers by further distancing him from his ugly, accurate history. Steed as a proxy, or even just a character we're meant to build a deep personal connection to, means establishing that people can relate to this character because they navigate the world similarly to him. But what happens when that character has to navigate through something that makes the audience uncomfortable? When this sweet cinnamon roll who can do no wrong actively participates in systems of harm? When this marginalized person still has a hefty position of privilege? When the intersection of their identities doesn't always mean positive things? I think those are really interesting questions to grapple with, and I'm kind of bummed that the show doesn't try to answer some of them with regards to race. Mind you, I don't think the only way to do so is through an extremely serious tone. We can look at the crew's initial confusion about Jim as an example. Not that there should be a similar scene with regards to race and how Steed navigates it, but rather as proof that the show is capable of having discussions about privileged people being overbearingly ignorant in their understanding of a marginalized identity and still keeping it lighthearted. I'm focusing on Steed because he's one of the few characters based on a real person, and because when said real life counterpart was discovered, folks had the most questions about the decision to make such a man the main character. Second to him is Blackbeard, or Edward Teach, whose in-show version is race bent. I feel like I've seen less brouhaha about Ed, with biracial readings of Blackbeard being some of the most in-depth analysis about race in the show. I've seen fans apply concepts like code switching or feeling like you don't belong to either side to certain Ed-centric scenes. It's been fascinating to read, especially in light of so many fans refusing to contend with the real life Edward Teach having been a participant in the slave trade. A lot of the foul and evil things Ed Teach did are not discussed in the show, least of all his role in captaining ships that held people as cargo. On one hand, the show did as little research as possible, apparently. But on the other hand, this is a familiar case of not wanting to make a sympathetic character too, too bad. But again, if the Empire is the butt of the joke, 
that should include the main characters who participate in the actions of the empire. Ed teaches casting specifically also returns us to the mindset that progressive storytelling should be free from criticism because it is progressive. Taika Waititi playing Blackbeard leaves some folks more likely to dismiss criticisms about the way our flag means death handles race because of a belief that a show with such a casting can't be flawed in such a way. Sidebar, I know some folks have mixed feelings about YTT. I don't feel like I know enough to speak on that, but I will point out that plenty of black people have been a bit weary of him since he made some disagreeable Black Lives Matter tweets, and I would encourage you to read up on that if you want to know more. However, with regards to this semi-focused conversation on fan reaction, I think it's worth discussing how YTT is brown, but safe brown. Often when white people are pushed to consider their understanding of race, they get defensive. When it comes to questioning their understanding of race in relation to media consumption, that defense can often fall back on the producers of said media. This show and my consumption of it can't be this, that, and the third because the executive producer is a Jewish Maori man who also plays a race-bent version of the main character. Meh. But I wonder if said people can recognize the influence of race on this narrative outside of how it can be used to shield them from critical thought. Can they do more than pay lip service? Survey says, no, not really. I don't think white people recognize Taika Waititi as a man of color, the same way I don't think they recognize Beyonce was black until she started being very blatant in her visuals, if that makes sense. Earlier, I described YTT as raceless, and it's not that he doesn't talk about race, that he doesn't have a catalog focused on indigenous characters and stories, specifically Maori characters and stories, but that his content is most rapidly consumed when mainstream fans don't have to ingest that. For all this love white folks have about our flag means death and what we do in the shadows, I haven't seen half as much interest in Reservation Dogs and YTT actually writes for that show. The show has a familiar black comedy tone, but Reservation Dogs is blatantly indigenous in front and behind the camera. YTT is raceless because white viewers can separate him from race when the story doesn't center it, but still use him and their support as a shield against critique despite ignoring his stories that do focus on race. A similar desire to keep race separate until it's useful pops up with how some folks discuss the existence of Olu Roach and Frenchie on the crew. There are these coupled ideas that this historically accurate representation of black pirates should be all the acknowledgement we need, and to talk about anything else would bring down the tone of the story, so we shouldn't do that. I feel like I've been bringing up Bridgerton a lot for somebody who gave up the show, but if this was a show like Bridgerton, where there is a harsh and sudden acknowledgement that racial dynamics exist, I could get the cries that, this is a happy, sexy, fun time. Let's not bring up the heavy stuff. But our flag means death is not that. The pilot episode has Olu, Roach, and Frenchie pretend to be slaves because the ship is boarded by the British Navy. Yes, Steed lets the rest of the crew borrow his clothes to be perceived as members of Gentry. Yes, Steed starts the series by discussing his belief that his crew should be paid a fair wage irrespective of loot. Yes, there is consistent commentary from the jump about wealth, class, and labor that is integral to the arc of the show and the season. And at the same time, the pilot episode has Olu, Roach, and Frenchie pretend to be slaves because the ship is boarded by the British Navy. The racial commentary is also there, but it drops off when it comes to Steed or the rest of the crew or the show as a whole beyond praise of how well they're all doing. I would love for season two to be honest with where Steed's family got their wealth and to have him confront the ugliness of that in relation to his connection with his crew. I would love for someone to ask Blackbeard where his previous ship came from and for him to have to address that. I don't know what trajectory the writers have in mind for these men and their crews. If the goal to avoid a story steeped in trauma means changing how they come to their ends, but if the road is one of redemption, or at least atonement, it seems necessary that certain things be addressed. 
As for the idea that bringing up slavery or race would make the show a downer, and this show is meant to be fun and escapist, why should we reinvest in the idea that fantasy has to maintain white comfort to be lighthearted? Beyond that, our flag means death has presented itself as being willing to make social commentary. Why should that exclude race? When talking about historical reinterpretations and race, the biggest bunion in the room since 2015 has been Hamilton. If you are so privileged as to not know what Hamilton is, it's a musical by Lin-Manuel Miranda based on the 2004 biography by Ron Chernow of America's founding father, Alexander Hamilton. Upon release, the show received a ton of attention and praise for the rap influences throughout the musical numbers and the casting wherein major figures of American history were all played by people of color. Now, we don't have time to unpack all of that, but Hamilton has since been a comparison point for pieces of media that similarly race bend history, and our flag means death is no exception. However, I do not totally agree with the comparison. Our flag means death is not trying to present itself as a historically accurate retelling of the relationship between Edward Teach and Steed Bonnet the way that Hamilton does via presenting itself as a adaptation of a biography that other historians find to be a deeply flawed account of history. What I do think is similar between Our Flag Means Death and Hamilton is fan reaction to it. I don't blame people for seeing fan cams or head cannons or long winding essays and being reminded of that fan art of Thomas Jefferson in a Miku binder. Sometimes all you need is other people's interest in something to turn you off from it. One of the biggest impacts of Hamilton, both the musical and the fandom, has been an egregious type of reimagining history that had people perceiving Thomas Jefferson, for example, as just a character and not a real person who did real harm and awful things. I could see people believing that our flag means death is going in the same direction, especially because so many viewers did not know that Ed and Steed were real people. While there is a difference between adaptation and artistic interpretation, both of these pieces have exhibited a growing unwillingness or inability from audiences to engage with stories outside of what they desire. We see the repeated idea that there is only one way to interact with this story, the narrow way that one set of fans wants it to be, and everything else is wrong. That's annoying when it comes to completely fictional media. For stories based off of history, however accurate they claim to be, this dedication to a fan-focused interpretation can be disturbing. It can mean talking about history, in relation to the media or not, becomes bogged down by fandom's determination to own a narrative. Another show often compared to Our Flag Means Death that struggles a bit less with this is Black Sails. A period drama written as the prequel to Treasure Island, Black Sails also recognizes the reality of a long queer history. The main characters, James Flint and John Silver, are both fictional characters from the original Treasure Island, but the show entwines their tale with that of real pirates, including Blackbeard. Black Cells provides a gruesome depiction of many of these real people that still isn't historically accurate, but is maybe more clearly fictionized due to the existence of the Treasure Island characters. I think Black Cells does a better job of avoiding this desire or this tendency to keep these historical figures super, super clean. But even in the gruesome, horrible, vile, violent things that we see these people do, it is still a watered down, tamed, curated version of who the characters who are based on real people really were. So although Black Cells does do a better job of not sugarcoating who these people were or the things they might have done, I still recognize that it is curated behavior that is meant to sculpt out an arc for characters who, at the end of the day, we are meant to feel some type of connection towards. I think at least the people who make it to the end, maybe not everybody, but those ones for sure. 
What's super interesting about black sales is that for a series that is comfortable showing the realities of how brutal the past was, they go to great lengths to prevent most of the historical pirates from interacting with slavery. Even in season four, where the major plot revolves around the pirates creating an alliance with the Maroons and slave communities of Nassau, the historical characters are placed in storylines that keep them away from a lot of that negotiation. Black Sails oddly shares this with Hamilton, which tries to distance any benefit the titular character had from slavery. The limit for reconfiguring these people's lives stops at navigating how they dealt with race from a truthful perspective. I started Black Sails after it went off the air, so I don't know if there was a similar issue when it started, though I wouldn't be surprised if there was. With regards to Our Flag Means Death, I think a lot of people are interacting with this show in either a very disapproving way or in a very fandom-focused way without holding space for both. When considering the goal of historical fiction to humanize or make historical figures comedic, I think there has to be space for both. Like, yes, this is a funny show, but we're also relating with really f***ed up people who did deplorable things. There is an inherent tension in that that we shouldn't avoid discussing. A frequent question asked of our flag means death has been why not just create original characters instead of using real people? But I don't necessarily agree that we can't dabble with historical figures and how we understand the past. On one hand, I get the concern about a growing inability to tell fact from fiction, but at the same time, I understand the appeal in taking figures who are seen in a very two-dimensional way and stretching that, pushing at our understanding of history dynamically. Also, there is marketing and pitching power in using recognizable names like Blackbeard that makes me understand why they didn't use a completely made-up character. Though I will say it's kind of blowing my mind that at least at the start, Jenkins and YTT didn't want to do any research. Like, I don't know, maybe that's just me. I love to learn. Regardless, what is worth questioning is if we are fictionalizing historical figures in order to perfect them. And I think that answer varies with each piece of media. For our flag means death, it is extremely concerning how many people have this idea that we all know bad things were happening in the 18th century. We all know pirates were violent, just don't bring it up. Like, what? If it is part and parcel of the life and times the story is set in, why wouldn't you bring it up? Why is there such a determination to ignore only specific parts of the reality this story was pulled from? Returning to the Verge interview, Pullum Moore asks, do you think of this show as a re-examination of the record? And Jenkins replies, well, no, because at the same time, you wouldn't want to meet the real Blackbeard. The real Blackbeard was a rapist who handed women over to his crew. The real Steve Bonnet was a slave owner. When we tell these stories, we have to be clear with what we're doing because all of these people were despicable. To make a fictionalized version of this history though, I think you have to try to staff a room where people have lived experiences that they can bring to the story. And we have to talk about things we're experiencing now because these stories are timeless. Part of what we are experiencing now, part of these timeless stories, are rooted in fuck shit that was birthed or flourished in the 18th century. It is absurd for some viewers to suggest that we completely ignore the conditions creating such an environment with regards to race, while they simultaneously cheer about the way the framework depicts queerness. At the end of this interview, Pullum Moore makes the point that the show about a slave-owning pirate should probably have some people of color in the writer's room. And while Jenkins agrees, that's pretty much the only time they discuss this aspect of the show outright. I believe that Jenkins and his room were well-intentioned in their decisions, but the subsequent impact of an inflexible fandom and a strong avoidance within the narrative has been deeply disappointing at best. I say this a bit in the very, very end in my goodbye, but 
I wanted to put it here as well in case you don't watch that far. But I realized in editing and kind of when I reached the end of this very long video that I didn't talk as much about specifics of how fans are reacting despite saying that I was interested in fan reaction because a lot of it is the same <laughs> that we see all the time. It is the same racist avoidance of making space for people of color in fandom and within narrative just with like a new coat of paint and a new set of arguments that fit the specifics of this show. So I think unconsciously <laughs> with that in mind when I was writing I actually was more interested in what about this show is so different from other pieces of media that we've received both in its queerness but also in its handling of race and especially with regards to how its writer's room is set up and who the executive producer is and ooh, ooh, ah, ah. so I recognize that <laughs> I said I was going to talk about fan reaction and really what I talk more about is the show because again I think the fandom bullshit is the same thing that we have been seeing time and time again and quite honestly quite depressingly we are probably going to continue to see as long as people hold on to the same few understandings of how to interact with different groups but that doesn't mean we can't have thought-provoking engaging different conversations about the media because even if fandom repeats the same patterns we are being shown different stories we are finally getting different voices out there in who is writing and who is producing content and I think it's worth talking about the gaps in that content as well as the things that we love so that these people and the people coming up behind them can continue to make improvements and changes and listen to feedback that is constructive as opposed to just sucking the crumbs from their assholes. One of the less cynical aspects of fictionalized history is that it encourages us to reconsider our understanding of the past and present. When I think about what I like of historical fiction, it's that it pushes me to learn more. I want to know the reality behind these stories even though I can hold them as two separate entities. What is imperative is that separating fact from fiction does not only apply to cracking our limited myths for an expanded reality in ways that benefit us. Reckoning with the truth means some of it is going to be awful. Similarly, fans afraid of discussing race cannot want people to divorce historical facts from this watered down interpretation while simultaneously being unable to engage with critique about this show without seeing it as a personal attack. Simply put, if you can be overjoyed at the potential to dabble with the expansion of our understanding of queer history, some of that energy should be directed towards examining present and past navigations of race as well. I think what so many Black fans want at the least is an acknowledgement of the complexity that this story is taking place in through the narrative. It feels performative to crack jokes about French aristocrats but then have a story go through great lengths to avoid stating where the main character's wealth comes from. We can hold space for multiple things to be true. We have the technology. If you made it to the end, thank you for making it to the end. This took so long and I feel like I only scratched the surface. As per usual, people are acting up on social media, um, being just despicable, unserious, deplorable human beings. So I didn't feel the need to like cover that, but know that that's happening too. The girlies are not safe on any platform. Anyway, have you watched Our Flag Means Death? How do you feel about it? I really do think that the show is worth a watch. Um, the pilot is kind of slow, but the characters are endearing, the jokes are funny, the storylines are engaging. Again, like the pilot is slow, but once you get past that, it's pretty good. Um, yeah, if, if this didn't dissuade you, I encourage you to, to watch it if you can. Anyway, 
if you frequent this if you frequently make it this far i'm happy to report that i am officially done with the semester um i tweeted this out but my summer series to watch will be atlanta i've only seen the first three episodes i think maybe the first two i've watched up to where earl and paperboy like end up arrested for some reason and like earl spends the whole episode in like county waiting for a baby girl to bail him out like that's as far as i've watched um anyway i'll be trying to catch up on that whole series over the next four months so maybe anticipate a video about that we'll see uh yeah that's all i got until next time stay safe i will catch you in the next echo chamber